Hi, welcome to the next SpectraFoo tutorial. This time I'm going to talk about SpectraFoo and captures. A capture is an audio recording that SpectraFoo has in RAM. You can either record a capture into SpectraFoo directly, or you can load an existing file. You can use captures for a number of things. You can load a capture to play back, to test a system or a piece of equipment with, or you can use a capture as a recording that you can analyze later. To start with, let's go to the capture control window. This is how we trigger captures within SpectraFoo. One method is to use timecode, where if we were sending timecode into SpectraFoo, we could set our punch in and punch out points. And you'll notice that these captures can be done in 24 bit. There is manual, which lets us simply hit the record button, and that'll record our audio in as a capture. And the last method, which is pretty unique, is the envelope. So just like an envelope from an oscillator or a sampler, we can set parameters for what we want to trigger SpectraFoo's recording and when it should stop, and SpectraFoo will sit there and do it uh, automatically. So you can set your trigger level, your detrigger level, and we have some flexibility as to how much audio is recorded before and after. So here we can also auto arm. Um, if you leave it on auto arm, SpectraFoo will just sit there monitoring audio and every time there is an event that triggers, it will go ahead and record. So you can use this to do multiple unattended recordings. But for right now, I'm just going to hit record, which will arm the system, but you can see nothing's happening. But if I raise my voice to the point that it goes over the threshold, it will start recording. And now we can check that out. The threshold, it will start recording. So we actually got some of my voice before I got to the threshold because of this pre-trigger time. And by moving this point farther this way, we can increase how much of that move, how much of that audio rather, would be uh, prepended to the file. So I've got a capture there, and let's say that I don't need this capture or I'm done with it. If you select the capture and go up to the capture menu, if I say remove, or you can hit command D, you can see that I have a dialog asking me whether or not I want to save this because this exists only in RAM. So we have the option of recording this to disk if we want, which I am not so concerned with. So I'll hit don't save. And you can set the behavior there in the Ask About Unsaved Captures. The other thing we can do is we can load a capture. So this brings up a standard open dialog, and I'm going to open a file of a recording that I did. And there we go. So next I'm going to show you what you can do with a capture once you've actually got it loaded in. Here we have our capture name are fields that tell us the start and end times of the capture and the overall length. We've got a field here that shows us the exact position of the cursor. And we have these two marker positions. So if I put the cursor here and enter that time, and then put the cursor there and enter that time, here in our delta field, that'll give us the distance between those two points in hours, minutes, seconds, and then fractions of a second. You can see here that we've got a couple of parameters. If I click draw dual trace, it'll take the two channels and overlay them so that we can see which has more signal at any point. And I'm going to undo that. And now I'm going to enable data slicing and re-shrink this. So now you can see that there is some signal happening here. When we enable data slicing, that means that whatever audio is happening at the instant of the cursor is sent to our instruments. So I can grab the cursor and I can drag this back and forth and you can see all of my instruments tracking. So that's what data slicing will do. And if we were running audio live through the system. Data slicing will interrupt that audio 
just to patch through whatever's happening with the capture. As soon as you turn off data slicing, we go back to real time. So I'm going to take that off. And let's go back into our large view of the capture. Now over here, we turn on details. That opens up the left-hand side so that we can see some information there as to what's happening, giving us some percentage full scale. And we turn on calibration. And again, this will show us our percentage above or below zero crossing at that instant of the cursor. Now down here you can see we have the ribbons field and the ribbons are a way of doing static analysis on a capture. So currently we're looking at the envelope ribbon. If I go and open a power balance ribbon you'll see two things. Number one, we now have both of these ribbons, the envelope and power balance, open at once so we can do multiple analyses. And here we have a power balance that's showing us at any given point which one of these signals has more strength and by how much. So just to confirm what we can see here in the waveforms, uh, the majority of the time the red signal here on the right channel is much stronger. So let me turn off power balance. We can go into power history which, just like the live power history instrument that I had, will show us our average and peak power not only over the course of the entire file, but by moving the cursor we can see readouts in the details column. Turn this off. We can enable the spectral history, which is showing a spectrogram type display for the two channels. Oops, let me remove that. And finally, we can look at correlation history, and as you can see, our correlations all over the map again because we've got two microphones that are non time aligned that are playing back the same audio. So, back to our original view. And next, let's talk about the playback engine. Down here in the corner, the square is your traditional stop button. The single arrow will play from whatever the cursor position is. And that'll just scroll until I hit stop. Now, if I hit play again, it will pick up from the same point. If I hit the next play button, this is play from beginning. So even though the cursor is in an intermediary position, that button will rewind to the beginning of the clip and start playing. This next arrow is where we can set the play mode. So as you can see, the arrow is currently showing left to right, which is traditional playback. If I click that, it will play backwards. Now, this next position, if you'll recall, I set marker positions earlier, so this will play back between the two markers. And we'll just repeat. And here we can also, you can see, grab these markers. Once you get close enough, the cursor changes. And we can just do that. And now, so that's another mode. And, whoops, the mouse is going crazy. This is a cycle playback. So that will just play in a loop, but in a traditional left to right. And then we have a marker one shot, which will just play from the first marker. Here, let me open this up.
to the second marker and stop. So, finally another click takes us back to our first mode. Our zoom in, zoom out buttons and out. And this obviously doesn't change the vertical scaling, only the horizontal on the time frame. And I can zoom back. And if you prefer, you can just grab this slider and zoom in or out and get a lot of magnification. So if you're looking for very small anomalies, you can certainly zoom in enough to see. Next, show you this. This is our green line. That's our cursor mode. Now, if I go and click this yellow line, this puts the playback engine into automation mode. So, I'll click to pencil and click. And now I've moved the level of our playback down. Click this tool and grab that point and I can move it. And this will actually affect the audio during playback. So now You could use this for a number of different things. If you've got a sample, let's say, of a song that you like to use for system tuning, uh, you can change the audio level right here with InspectraFoo without having to use any other utilities or hardware. Uh, you could also take a capture and build a volume envelope around it for analysis. So let me just zoom this down real quickly. And when we look at this... That obviously is affecting the audio output from the clip in the SpectraFoo. I'm going to maximize this again. The other thing you can see here, I'm going to go back into this mode. You can see that we now have two traces, a brighter and a darker. This is actually drawing the waveform pre and post automation. So we have the original, and you can see when I start moving this point, That's actually going to start showing you. There we go. You can see that the brighter trace is showing you what the sound is going to be. After it's affected by the automation. So using these utilities, you can build some fairly complex waveforms directly within SpectraFoo without having to go to any other utility. And something to keep in mind is that now that I've done all of these automation changes, if I close this waveform, and let me go back to my capture list window, if I say remove the selected capture, this will ask me, because I still have it enabled, it will ask me if I want to save this before it leaves memory. If I was to click save, it would actually rewrite the audio file with all of those changes in. So that's another way that you can use SpectraFoo as a quick and dirty audio editor on perhaps a recording that you just did within SpectraFoo for analysis. So I hope this has given you some insight into SpectraFoo's capture utility how you can record and load captures, how you can save them, how you can analyze them in a static or dynamic way, and do some automation to them and save that back out to disk. So until next time, I hope that you can use SpectraFoo and Capture Utility in your workflow, and I look forward to showing you some new things in the next video.